going on a bear hunt. We're going to catch a big one. What a beautiful day. I'm not scared. As a writer, parent and son of teachers, I feel passionate about reading. I believe that a child who's interested and engaged by real books will read much more readily than a child who's force-fed phonics and only phonics. Two big furry ears. Two big furry ears. Two big spiky teeth. Two big spiky teeth. It's a bear! Today I'm not going on a bear hunt. Instead, I'm on a hunt to track down teachers who promote children's creativity. I hope to discover whether the current political vogue for testing, phonics and league tables is in danger of destroying creativity in schools. The bear's coming up to our house. Open the door up the stairs. Dup, 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 dup. Along the passage, into the bedroom. Into bed, under the covers. Not going on a bear hunt again. I think that both at primary and secondary school, there's less of an emphasis on reading and engaging in real books. This saddens me, since I learned to read by becoming engrossed in stories. advocating a return to the unique techniques used by one of my teachers. She used to come in in the morning and say, no breathing. You had your last breath. And the weak ones just used to keel over and die. You'd hear them at the back of the class going down. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. Some of us figured out what to do. Snatch a quick breath under the desk lid and she wouldn't be able to see you breathing. Does my audience at so North London's it. Martin Junior School really think down. most of my schoolmates okay. asphyxiated? <laughs> no. The kids recognise that I'm using poetic licence. 48 at the beginning of the week, only five of us left. I'm here to tell the tale. Survival. Can you say that? One, two, three. Survival. Excellent. Hopefully it has right, some resonance for them and might feed their imaginations. But can you teach creativity? That's a question I put to Bethan Marshall from King's College London. Creativity is something you can definitely teach because what you ask children to do is to explore and experiment as much as they can and never be content with one idea. Creativity in pupils can be fostered, believes former new teacher of the year James Bidulph at Ranala School in East London. I think sometimes when we ask children to sit down and write a poem, they, they, they get um, scared by the white page, the looming page in front of them. Um, and having the opportunity to share ideas and make mistakes and, and correct, their, correct their ideas in the speaking and listening process gives them the confidence. And so when they come to write, the, the white page is actually has imaginary ink there already. All they have to do is find the words and put them on there. James doesn't need my help to teach creatively, but he did recently attend my talk on that tricky subject, ways of teaching poetry. We usually think of a piece of paper as something we write on in our culture from left to right and in lines. Well, instead, think of a piece of paper as a physical space. So let's say this thing here is the playground. OK, there's the playground. We're going to write a poem about the playground a playground in words. Well, here's some questions you can ask. You can say, what can I see? What can I hear? What do I say? And what do I think and feel? See whether you can answer some of those questions and we'll write them in here in the playground to make this composite playground out of words, okay? 
over to you. The doors that go swinging doors. Swinging doors. So creaking and squeaking doors. Children laughter. Laughter. Yeah. Clanging of the cutlery. Um, anyone want to kind of read theirs out in a twosome? Glug, 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 glug. Do Fruit machine. Do that with you. Subsequently, in class, James wets his pupils' creative juices by showing them objects from what purports to be his granny's trunk. Purple glove. Only one, though. There's also a sample of, of coral. I heard somebody whisper coral there. Coral from a distant land. What else did I find? I also found this, this ancient... Compass. You can pass that around as well. Compass of finding places, exploring. He then reads them a story. They came by water. Moving to the school hall, James asks them to think of ways to act out their own story about seafaring, exploration, and invasion. One, two, three. Then freeze frame three key moments from the beginning, middle and end. Pupils write down key phrases about how the explorers respond to their new environment, what they feel and what they see. Back into the classroom, James creates an instant poem marrying the creative lines from the different groups. Trees that don't stop growing. Trees that don't stop growing. Or trees that grow... Trees that stop... Don't, I'll write that down. Trees... that don't... stop growing. Let's read the beginnings of my poem all together, and then you have a chance to get on with your own. Ready? One, two, <coughs> three. Hyenas laughing, wind whipping knees. Trees that don't stop growing. They came by water. James then encourages his class to have a go at writing their own poems. Yatsing, would you mind, though, standing up and reading your poem in a big, clear voice? These everlasting plains of darkness, I hear the waterfall crashing into the rocks. We sacrifice, dance, and pray to the gods. Everything is so happy. But no, who are these chalk-faced spirits? Will they ever leave? The shadows are taking over. Lord, please help us. But when we pray, the sun's rays break through the walls of shadows. We are free. Is there anything you did today, do you think, that you picked up from the inset day that I did? The drama and the, uh, and the sort of activities le were leading up to, to uh, the writing activity that you suggested, where you have different sheets of paper um, so the children can explore what they can see, what they can hear, what they can feel, think and, and say. So I really enjoyed that idea, uh, um, and it's worked in other contexts as well, below down the school. Um, and if the children get stuck, they, they can refer to the, to the, the group sheets that, we, that are put up around the classroom. So, given that highly creative display, should I stop worrying about how literacy is taught in our primary schools? Well, no. Since uh, 1988 and the national curriculum, um, politicians have exerted greater and greater control. And topics like the teaching of reading, uh, the teaching of grammar, uh, seem to attract politicians again and again and again. And I think it's in those areas that they've maintained a stranglehold on the curriculum that frankly has grown. So the key points were 1988, the national curriculum, 1997 when the literacy and numeracy strategies came in, and now we have the Rose Inquiry and already the national curriculum is about to be changed. The statutory national curriculum is about to be changed for the first time in a number of years. And I think that's symbolic of the extent to which politicians control the primary curriculum. We now have a government obsessed with teaching children to read almost exclusively using the synthetic phonics method. 
This approach, in my view, is likely to stunt a child's imagination and delay reading for pleasure. Now, I do hope you're sitting s -i -t -t -i -n -g comfortably as Dr. Rona Stainthorpe from the Institute of Education guides us through phonics basics. If we take the word sit, then what we have to teach the children is the letter S stands for S, I stands for I, T stands for T. We're going to go S, I, T. And then we're going to combine those so that we have the word sit. We can do this very fluently. As long as we know lots and lots of letter sounds, then there are whole words that we've never come across before, but we can read accurately. If you learn a lot of letter sound correspondences and how to blend, then we've got a whole family of words that you can read. Bit, fit, hit, kit, etc. All right, we've got another one to do today. And it's the letter F, and the sound is And you need to put your T over your bottom lip, and then blow. Brilliant, Tom, well, well done. Let's have a look. Notebooks out. You need to turn a couple of pages now, and we've got to do the letter F. Off you go. Okay, you gone then? Okay, start from the bend, all the way down, and then the bow tie. And again. Oh, that's beautiful handwriting. Can you show me how? Are phonics the equivalent of five portions of fruit and veg a day, proven beyond almost all reasonable doubt that they're good for you? Or will some children be highly allergic to phonics and fail to thrive? Well done, Tom. Can Beth you and Marshall me points out that phonics are useless at working out one of the most popular starting points of a children's story. The difficulty with teaching phonics in the English language is that it is unphonetic. Take the classic fairy tale opening, Once Upon a Time There Was, and then ask yourself how you describe the letter O in once phonetically, because it's pronounced as a W, and the letter A in was is pronounced as an O oh kind of sound. And these are almost unique to those words. And so the trouble with English is that there are so many exceptions to the rule that sometimes you just have to know the word. Yes, it's map. map. It's map sound. It's a map. If phonics are such a brilliant way to teach children to read, then presumably easy phonetical words would be mastered first. One of the things that's most interesting when you watch very small children learning to read is that they stumble over words that are phonetically absolutely simple to do, like it or at, um, and yet they always get things like elephant, and they will encounter it, and they'll see the word elephant, and they'll remember it the next time. There's something appealing about the shape, and they're just remembering the look of it, which was the basis of the look and say method, which kind of made you just remember the words off by heart. So there are different ways in which you can approach it. The jury is still out on whether it's the best way of teaching reading, says Sue Ellis from the University of Strathclyde. There are lots of unworked through and unresearched problems about phonics that I do think England would have been wise to investigate before it went for a completely phonics line. For example, there's no research evidence at all that I can find on what happens to children who simply can't hear a sound. When you start learning to speak, you hear a word, and that word for you is represented by an object. And some children are very, very slow to move past that stage. So I was interviewing a child last week, and I was trying to get him to give me words that would rhyme with chair. And he had a choice between cheese, table, and hair. And I was saying to him, chair, what rhymes with chair? Is it cheese, table, hair? What rhymes with chair, table. Because as far as he was concerned, table and chair went together and he couldn't move past this idea of the object to actually just listen to the sound of the word. Now for a child like that, sitting for a year in a phonics class where that's the only way into reading offered is going to be hugely, hugely problematic. I can see that phonics can be fun as Genevieve Draper demonstrates with her year one class at Ranella Primary School. So when you get your card, it's top secret. So don't show anyone, because you don't want to find any other partner but your own. So when you get your letter, have a look at it. 
Think about what sound that letter makes. And then you're going to have to find your partner. Don't show anyone. Keep it secret. We're going to stand up and try and find our partner by saying the sound of the letter. Ready? <coughs> Off we go, say your sound. So how are phonics taught at Ranala? Head teacher Angela Tapscott explains the practice behind the theory. Well, what we find is that a lot of our children find it difficult just to do things um, in an auditory sense. They like to see things in a visual sense and also to feel them, to, to sort of address the kinesthetic approach to learning. Genevieve takes a kinesthetic approach to the teaching of phonics and encourages her pupils to use their bodies to make letter shapes. So freeze where you are. I'm going to touch you on the head and see if you can make the sound of your letter. Good girl. Good boy. Oh, this is a good one down here. Can you tell me why the children made the shapes of the letters with their bodies? It's just the more practice they have at the shape and the feel and the sight and the sound and anything related to the letter, the more chance there is that they'll actually understand and, and know about that letter and know how to use it and know what it means. We find for children, especially here, that that kind of approach makes sure we cover all the bases and it does actually give them a better understanding and a better grounding. The year one class, um, they were sounding out letters and looking at the different sounds of the words and also relating them to something that was very real when they were relating them to pieces of fruit and using the words to describe what they were seeing and what they were thinking about. It smells like mango, does it? Are you sure? Just one word, can you think of one word to describe it? Sweet. Jalal, what's your word to describe it? Spiky. It's kind of spiky, isn't it? Christopher, what's your word? Yellow, brilliant. And I think that actually helped them to understand better and make them more interested because the lesson on something as basic as phonics does need to be interested. What was your word? Juicy. Yum, sticky, soft and juicy. Yum, sticky, soft and juicy. Yum, sticky, soft and juicy. Yum, yum, yum. So how and why have we got ourselves into the position of favouring one method of teaching reading? Phonics above all all others, even those which promote reading real books from the very start. start its appeal might lie with its again. seeming simplicity, Good thinks Beth and Marshall. Driver. Politicians are very keen on answers to questions. If there is a problem, they like a solution. And the thing about phonics is it seems scientific, it seems rigorous, and it seems like it has answers. And it's a package that you can give. So there are people who produce commercial packages like Ruth Miskin or the Jolly Phonics, and you can say, off the shelf, here you go, here is an answer. What they're less keen on are people like me who sort of say, well, it's a little bit fuzzy and it's a bit grey and children learn differently, don't they? If they stopped to think about it for a second and looked at their own children, they would remember that actually they learned very, very differently. But that seems all a little bit floaty and less rigorous, and that's not what they like. Dominic Wise from Homerton College, Cambridge, concurs. I think phonics is... Um quick to say the word and it sums up actually a very complicated set of strategies and procedures that we need to teach that we use to teach reading um, and in fact if we're a politician to stand up and say well actually what I think we need is first of all children to be engaged in wonderful texts and that we need to very carefully balance up the input we give on on letters sounds words well you can see that um, of course, that takes too long to say. So um, I think that is there is, a, there is an issue there, yes, in what's quick to say, what sounds tough and effective. Tactfully wending his way around the fallout from the government's recent obsession with phonics is Redbridge's literacy advisor, John Hickman. There is an inevitable political knee jerk behind any decision like this to, t to go full on with phonics, simply because of the notion of raising standards, leaked tables. It's what governments get judged on. However, behind all that, hopefully, with people in schools and in LEAs, there is an, there's an indication that we are engaged with pupil entitlement and all children are entitled to read and we need to work out the best ways to help them get to that goal. Up on the gate. Up on the wall. 
Rather cheekily, the Institute of Education's reading expert, Rona Stainthorpe, takes the battle over phonics into my own real book's backyard. Now, the whole purpose of teaching children to read is so that they can read books, lovely books, like We're Going on a Bear Hunt. Just think about the text here. We're going on a bear hunt. We're going to catch a big one. What a beautiful day. We're not scared. Uh-uh, mud. Thick, oozy mud. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. Now, if you can read the words, you can read this book independently. As it happens, because of the nature of this particular traditional rhyme, we get lots and lots of repetition, which is very good. Squelch, squirch, squelch, squirch. Now, you clearly got to use phonics to work those out because they're not real words. They're wonderful onomatopoeia. And the children will love saying them. Once they've finished one book by Michael Rosen, well, if you've got independent reading skills, you go to your class library and find another one, because that's what good readers do. They choose books by authors that they like. So there you are, you choose smelly, jelly, smelly fish. There's a man over there, and he's sitting in the sand. If you've not had phonics and you then can read, he buried himself at, and you've never come across tea time before, You'll just have to guess at it. And you might guess wrong because it's not terribly predictable. He buried himself at tea time. Now he's looking for his hand. Of course, if you've got good decoding skills, then you can see those words, you can work out what they mean, and then you can really have fun understanding this very exciting other book by Michael Rosen. From my perspective, it doesn't matter much if my younger readers substitute their own words for tea time. Their words might be an improvement. What matters is their engagement with reading. There's a strange view that in some way, if you teach children to read using phonics, you're going to stop their creativity. I really do think this is slightly bizarre. If you teach children phonics, you enable them to become independent word readers quickly. What you want them to do is to get the word reading over and done with so that they can really engage with the texts. I happen to know that years ago, Rona Stainthorpe read my chocolate cake story to her sons so frequently that they knew it off by heart. And suddenly, in the middle of the night, I woke up and I thought, chocolate cake. Now, this may sound immodest, but I bet their enjoyment of my books, and other books by even more brilliant authors than I could ever be, was a driving force in motivating them to read. Shh! Out the room, down the passage, careful not to tread on the creaky floorboard outside my mum and dad's room, because if I tread on that and wake them up, I'll be in trouble. Shh! On down the passage, into the kitchen, over to the cupboard. Oh, there it is again. Yeah, I'm going to put it down just there. <laughs> just going to have a little look at it. Then I notice some little crumbly bits on the side of the cake. So I think if I take a knife, I could just tidy it up a little bit. No one would know. Put it down. See. Oh, yeah, there's all the nice little crumbly sticky bits. It's all going to go in there. Yeah, belly, belly, belly. It's a hum, 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 hum. <laughs> so I think maybe I could take a whole slice of it. So I pick up the knife, and this time I'm going to make the slice through the crispy icing on the top, through the squashy icing in the middle. Psh, yes, and I've got a whole slice here this time. I've got a whole slice, and it's going to go in. <laughs> And now I can't stop myself, so I got the knife and I'm going psh, 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 and I got Oh no! It's gone. I've come to have coffee with Jennifer Chu, a retired teacher who unlike me, has complete faith in the efficacy of phonics. 
Phonics is the best for beginners because we have an English um, alphabetic writing system and phonics simply teaches children right at the beginning what to do with those letters, those black marks that they see on the page. But the problem with English, surely, is that it's, it's not regular. It can take a letter combination, it can produce several different sounds. Right, well, that's a very old-fashioned kind of argument, and in fact it doesn't fit the, the modern best phonics programs that we have. They all deal with that problem. They teach the alternative sounds for letters and alternative ways of spelling sounds. But surely that's not phonics, is it? Because then we have to look at those letters in the context of the word, so O-U as it is in the word sound or in the word U. So in fact, they, the children have to learn whole words Anyway, in other words, it's whole word recognition, isn't it? No, I think it's still underpinned by phonics. I mean, there is research which shows that even word recognition is underpinned by good phonics knowledge. Well, I think we just have to agree to differ on that one, Jennifer. Well, but I think there is evidence. And the current political vogue for phonics is partly based on a longitudinal study conducted in Clackmannanshire. This seemed to provide the evidence that the government needed to suggest Phonics was the quickest way to raise literacy standards. The important thing to remember about Clackmannanshire is that it was set up to compare two different types of phonic teaching. If they had wanted to look at whether or not phonics teaching was better than other forms of teaching, they would have had to have controlled for a huge number of other variables, which they didn't because that wasn't the question they were asking. The Clackmannan experiment took place at a time of enormous funding for early years. It was a huge early intervention project sponsored by the Scottish office and every local authority in Scotland had to bid for money to implement a project. Although it was a limited study conducted within Scotland's smallest LEA, the government seized on it as proof that phonics worked and justified the imposition of synthetic phonics on all schools. Everyone in Scotland, I think, is delighted that Clackmannanshire did well. But the local authority did a lot of good things in terms of how it used its money. First of all, it's a small local authority. It's got just 16 primaries and three secondaries. And it chose to use its money from the Scottish office in a very focused way, focusing just on seven schools and two projects. One project was a comparison between synthetic and analytic phonics and the other project was a home link project where they funded teachers to go and work in four of their schools doing things like setting up library borrowing services, homework clubs, helping in classrooms, doing home visits and a whole host of things to facilitate relationships around literacy between the school and the home. We don't know whether the children's reading improved because of the Home Link Intervention Project or because of the Phonics Project. It's likely that both had a success. It's important to remember, however, that Clackmannan is not the best performing local authority in Scotland. It's about average. To be fair, before the government decided to impose phonics as the pre-eminent reading method, Jim Rose was asked to have a look at the evidence. So what persuaded him that phonics was the best way to teach our children to read? Clackmannanshire was uh, an interest of the select committee at the time, uh, in which all these issues obviously were being raised. And I have to tell you, there are a lot of Clackmannanshires on this side of the border as well. And when we saw the quality of that work, which People describe as synthetic, but it's the ingredients that we need to think about. What's going on there that makes it easy for children to crack the code, to be able to segment, blend, and do all those things that are necessary to understand the words on the page, to recognise the words on the page. And the Clackmannanshire experience certainly was um, germane to all of that. I mean, it was certainly a very positive um, outcome that they were, they were getting there. But it was only one of several very important pieces of evidence that we looked at. There are lots of studies from around the world which lead us to conclude that using early phonics teaching enables children to read more accurately, more quickly and with greater degree of understanding. This comes from America, from Australia, some from New Zealand, in fact some from Sweden and Denmark, Germany 
and even England and Scotland. Reading is not a linear process where you deal with phonic work first and then deal with comprehension, creativity after that. These things are done at the beginning simultaneously. Phonic work is a time-limited sequence. Once children have become skilled in that way, they use those skills very obviously to learn more, not just in English, but right across the curriculum. But the comprehension strand of all of this, the language comprehension, starts well before phonic work, continues through it, and is enriched by it. And then, of course, we're in the game of children having learned to read, read to learn, and off we go. I think the case is still not proven. Capturing the child's imagination is often the first step in starting to read. And that's what real books do. I will always insist that the only way in which we learn how all letters and all sounds match up, or not, is through recognising whole words. And the only way in which we recognise whole words is seeing them in use uh, right, in sentences, stories and poems. Do I like writing poems? I do, and I like making up poems. And the very last poem I made up was a poem that I had to make up because we were all going on a journey. I was on a place called the Barbican and there were lots of poets and we had to go on a journey and I had to write a poem to help us go on the journey and I thought, right, how do we go on a journey in a poem? It goes like this. You gotta move it to prove it. Move it to prove it. In a plane, on a train, take a trip on a ship, you gotta move it to prove it. Move it to prove it. Take a hike, take a bite, use your feet on the street. You gotta move it to prove it. Move it to prove it. Are we there? Where? Are we near? We're here. You gotta move it to prove it. In my view, all the effort put into measuring, tracking, and testing pupils is liable to achieve the exact opposite of what the government intends. I'm writing to Hackney Council to complain about... For instance, at Key Stage 3 and GCSE level, pupils are endlessly tested on their ability to write a letter of complaint to you the council. Deliberately. Now, I've been forced as a grown-up to write many a letter to Hackney Council, and it's one of the most boring activities I ever face. It's pure torture. Faithfully. So what on earth is the point of making lively children do it in class? It's madness. English teacher Dave Shawman agrees. The national curriculum, to an extent, uh, can limit the creativity in the way that you teach. I think particularly in writing, um, there seems to me here to be a much greater emphasis placed on non-fictional, transactional, factual sorts of writing at the expense of narrative writing. At Key Stage 3, one of the boxes English teachers need to tick is empathy. It's Friday afternoon and Hampstead School's Class 9 are studying the curious incident of the dog in the night time. So here we go. We've got Christopher and why he doesn't tell lies. Is the narrator the Christopher is a 14-year-old boy with Asperger's syndrome. Reason. He's had a misunderstanding with so that elusive way. species, a bobby How on the does... beat. What do you think Christopher's dad thinks about Christopher hitting this police officer, Edwin? Because um, the officer was, like, provoking him, kind of, because he's autistic, so he thinks that, that the police officer was provoking him, something like that. What did he do to provoke him? I think we can use that word but I, we could only use it for Christopher. What did he do which upset Christopher, Sam? He was asking too many questions too fast. He, that was part of it, and he did one other thing, Blondie. Touched him. Touched him. Who can feedback? Who's got something to say about the relationship? David Shawman gently probes to see whether his class understands the complexities of the father-son relationship. What was the word that you used? Frustrating. 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 Why did you cho choose that word? because his dad's getting quite annoyed. He keeps asking questions and questions and questions, and he won't give up till he finds out a proper answer that he thinks is legit. That's quite negative. Is there anything positive about Christopher's relationship <coughs> with his father? Because his dad's, like, patient with him and puts up with him, and, and like, they, you know, they do seem to love each other, I, I reckon. OK, so there seems to be some, some love in the He's family between them. 
good. Well, because he has this problem, uh, his dad has to constantly give him attention, and cook for him and get things for him. and So he can't really go out of the house unless he's going to school. So because they're so close to each other and constantly bonding, they probably love each other a lot. We can sit on the fence for that one. We can have people on the side, that's fine. But what we are going to do now, we're going to be doing some hot seating. This is like the idioms we drew the other day. It's a hot seat, okay? Um, somebody is going to become Christopher's father. And it is your chance to ask Christopher's dad what it's like living with Christopher. Your job and your groups is to come up with three to five questions for Christopher's dad. And you get frustrated when Christopher attacks you or not being able to hug him or love him. Okay. Meet Christopher's father. Who would like to go first? Thank you, Ben. How do you feel about Christopher getting arrested? Um, I'm obviously disappointed about it and uh, wish I hadn't, but I don't think it's his fault and hopefully it won't happen again and it will stay out of trouble. Do you ever get feel really frustrated and stressed out with Christopher? Yeah. Do you just want to leave? Uh, no, I'd, I'd never leave him. Uh, what sort of father would I be? Uh, I do get frustrated, but I'd never even consider leaving him. It's all excellent stuff. Developing empathy during English lessons might just possibly lead to more communication within relationships. Fewer people inclined to bully and injure others, and who knows, a healthier society and future. As well as getting all those A to C passes at GCSE. Wow. But surely it's all a bit late in the process. Why wait until year nine? If you teach four or five-year-olds from real books, get them engaged and read to them regularly, then they'll develop empathy naturally. Take a look at my audience at Martin School. Are they laughing at me or with me because they empathise with my younger self? It's getting towards bedtime and me and my mum were sitting watching telly. And my mum says to me, Michael, time for bed now. And suddenly my ears don't work. And I get up. And I think, I want to go on watching that programme, so I'll go round behind the sofa, OK, and I think if I stop breathing, she won't know I'm here, so I'll just disappear myself so I can go on watching the telly... <laughs> and she goes, Michael, I know you're there. And I go, I'm not. <laughs> and she goes, what are you talking about? One of the joys of primary schools up until fairly recently, once we got rid of the 11 plus, was that it was a space for children to enjoy and love learning. At seven, most European countries and the States, children have only been in school for a year. And what we've been doing is we've been saying, uh, you've got to learn to read from the age of four. Most countries don't actually introduce children to books until about the age of six. They're just read to up until that point. And what we're doing by introducing the test so early on is labelling a lot of children as failures in reading. And that's just awful, because why would you then ever want to pick up a book? So already we're making them feel unhappy. And from the pleasure principle, how sad. These children don't like reading. That wonderful imagination, that kind of escape that all of us who love reading got, they don't have, because they see reading as very instrumental and something that gets you past a test and a comprehension exercise. In the end, I think testing and league tables are irrelevant. When you combine that rigmarole with the relentless drilling of phonics, we're loading five-year-olds with pressure and dullness. A radical rethink is needed. Teachers and children need to be less anxious and more creative. My belief is that schools should turn themselves into publishing houses, producing their pupils' work rather than faffing around with phonics and testing. So instead of children constantly rehearsing what they would read or what they would write, they should plunge straight into the joys of making books, plays, poems for each other, no matter how simple. One of the crucial things in teaching children to write is getting them to think about the reader because 
the reader-writer relationship is the most important. And the problem with what's happening at the moment is you're just thinking about writing in isolation. You're not thinking about the impact that it has on the reader. So if you want to help children to write, you get them to think about who, who's going to read it. And a very, very powerful motivator then is to make the audience real. Strangely enough, I'm keen to help my competition and have even more writers around. The younger, the better. That's why I go on performing in schools as part of my quest to advocate the reading of real books and to encourage children to write their own. When I visit schools, children often ask me, do I really like writing books? Yes, I do. Yes, so I do like writing poems. I love it and it's ever so easy and you, every single one of you here can do it. If there's something you don't, remember what I said right at the very beginning, I said if there's something you don't like, the best thing you can do about it is write about it. If you hear a conversation you think, that's interesting, write it. There we are, it's that easy.